So good evening, everybody. Welcome to this another session of congenital heart disease. Talking about sequential analysis. The most important thing is this quote says working hard is important, but there is something that matters even more. That is believing in yourself. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find it out how far they have gone. This is what exactly aptly true for a pediatric or a congenital heart disease. If you have to really work hard to find out diagnosis, what exactly this person is suffering from. And very apt statement made by Joseph Perloff way back almost 30 years down the line, that diagnosis of congenital heart disease represents an epitome of applied clinical knowledge. When correct inferences are drawn from accurate observations, diagnoses are made with gratifying frequencies. In approach to congenital heart disease, we have fetal circulations, intracardiac pressure, sequential approach, important consideration by before doing an echo examination, classification, whether to sedate a child or not. This is what most important thing of a fetal circulation is. During our fetus time, we have a placenta, which is exchange of oxygen levels. The blood, the unpurified blood comes from umbilical artery to placenta, get purified and being carried by umbilical veins through ductus venosus into the right atrium, which is diverted to left atrium by fossa ovalis. Whatever the blood is gone to right atrium, goes to right ventricle, then to pulmonic artery and through artery, ductus arteriosus goes to descending aorta. So we have a shunt at three different levels. One is the ductus venosus, fossa ovalis and ductus arteriosus. This is how the things works when we have a fetal circulation in neonatal or sorry, fetal circulations. Well, it differs, the fetal circulation differs from adult circulation because of fetal exchange lies in placenta where the adult exchange lies in lungs. So we have a shunt, shunt at the level of placenta, foramen ovale, ductus arteriosus and ductus venosus. And Lungs only receive 15% of the blood supply, hence pulmonic arteries are small. And that's why whenever the newborn is born, we are able to hear a pulmonic flow mouse. RV, RA, they are larger than LV and LA. And RV pressures are almost equal to LV pressure. And that's why we say RBB kind of a changes in newborns. So what happens after birth? The primary exchange of circulation after birth shifts the blood flow from a gas exchange to from placenta to lungs, leading to umbil umbilical cord interruptions, increased systemic vascular resistance as a result of a closure of valley road resistance placenta, closure of ductus venosus due to lack of blood flow from placenta, lungs expansion happens, reduction in pulmonic vascular resistance, increase in pulmonic blood flow, fall in PA pressures, functional closure for a manual and PDA closure because of increased arterial saturation. If I have to go back to my original slide, here the placenta is knocked off. So whatever the blood which is going to umbilical vein, which bypasses liver through ductus venosus, this also collapses. Now we're here in RA and RV, the fossa well is, the, is closed. And finally, the blood starts going from RA to RV to pulmonic circulations. And from pulmonic circulation back to LA, then LV. Because of increased saturation, even the ductus arteriosus closes. And then the blood goes from LA to LV, then finally to the brain, and then to the ascending water. So we can have three places where shunt could be possible. One is a ductus venosus, which is known as ligament of TDs, forum and ovale, which is known as fossa ovalis or secundum ASD, or ductus arteriosus, which we call as patent ductus arteriosus. <laughs> Now, intercardic pressures. Remember, this is very important. This is 70% is the saturation. 100% is the saturation on left-hand side. Right atrium has got a pressure of 3 millimeters of mercury. Right ventricle, 25 oblique 3. Right pulmonic artery has got a pressure of 25 divided by 10. 10 is a left atrial pressure. On the other hand, left atrial pressure is 8. And left ventricle pressure in newborn is about 55 millimeters of mercury. Now, sequential approach, what do we look for a sequential approach? We look for a visceral situs, atrial situs, atrioventrial concordance, ventricular localization, and a great artery connections. This one picture, which tells you aptly 
as soon as you start doing an echocardiography. How does it go back? As soon as you put a transducer in a subcostal window, what you develop in subcostal window, this is a spine. Here is one vessel. And finally, the left ventricle opens on the left hand side. This is anterior, this is posterior, this is left, and this is right. And whenever you go from a transverse position in the index marker at 3 o'clock, first thing you will see a spine with two structures. One is pulsating, the other one is not pulsating. The pulsating structure is aorta, non-pulsating structure is IVC. And this IVC opens into the chamber, which is known as morphological RA. And that's how we remember the the pulsate like uh, structure which is not pulsating opens into a structure which is known as morphological RA. And this morphological RA is connected to a morphological RV through this tricuspid valve. Similarly, the other structure is morphological LA, which is connected to LV through this mitral valve. We'll come to identify how do we identify this. RA has got only one IVC drainage and SVC drainage, whereas left atrium has got the, both the pulmonic vein drainage on left side 2 and the right side 2 also. We move from this subcostal window, tracing our transducer into the apical window. And when we trace our transducer to the apical window, what exactly happens? We move from this subcostal window to apical window. In apical window, this we know is morphological RA. Other structure is morphological LA. And then we try to trace the veins, pulmonic vein. Look, here is the right upper, right lower. Here is the left lower pulmonic vein is seen, left upper pulmonic vein is not seen normally. Next structure comes is, what we look is, we'll say that this is right atrium, this is left atrium. Now we have to identify my left ventricle and right ventricle. Before then that, we have to identify our mitral and tricuspid valve. Look at the connection of these mitral and tricuspid valve is. Tricuspid valve insertion is relatively apical place as compared to mitral valve insertion. So here is the mitral valve insertion, here is the tricuspid valve insertion. And relatively placed, apically placed tricuspid valve insertion is a known fact that this is tricuspid valve, this is mitral valve. So here LA through mitral valve is connected to the left ventricle. And how do we say the LA is connected to the left ventricle? We look at LV, which is almost bullet shaped. It has no tubercular band in it, where RV has got a lot of tubercular band. This is bullet shaped and this is triangular shape. So we identify this as RA through IVC. Other structure is LA, which we identify the pulmonic veins. Then we identify the mitral and tricuspid valve. Then we LV and then RV. LV has got a papillary muscles. RV does not have a papillary muscles. This is how we understand the nomenclature of morphological LA, RA, RV, and LV. The next substance come in this subset of population is great vessels connections. How do we understand great vessel connection is whenever we go to short axis view, this is a normal nomenclature where aorta is right into the center and the peripheral artery wraps around, the pulmonic artery wraps around the aorta to bifurcate into right and left pulmonic artery. And look at this the transposition of great vessel. We do not see two aorta with wrap around vessels. This we see two small parallel vessels lying close to each other. If we happen to see these two parallel vessels lying close to each other, then think possibly we are dealing with transposition of great vessels. And that's a very simple way of understanding what is situs solitus. When we open up a loop, if it's pointing toward left hand side, we say situs solitus, we deal with. Then we identify the morphological structures, then we talk of a great artery connections. The number of things which happens, look, in this view, we are able to identify the bicuspid aortic valve. And pulmonic artery always bifurcates to left and right, left on this side, right on this side, bifurcation of pulmonic artery. Now, another important thing of pediatric population when you assess this subset of population is whether to sedate this child or not to sedate this child. We always try not to sedate the child unless until we are sure that patient is not cyanotic. And how do we look for cyanosis? 
we always look for sinuses by doing a pulse oximeter. And second thing is we always scan a child when the child is weeping. If the child is weeping and if you are able to see no major abnormalities, obviously no major means non-correctable. Suppose you happen to see a double chambered right ventricle, transposition of great vessels or single ventricle. In those cases, we try to avoid sedation because the significantly desaturated children they are already. And that's what the recommendation of 2014 from Jace American College of Cardiac Society this, they are potentially preventable. Sedation is associated with low likelihood of diagnostic error, few imaging quality concern, and fewer incomplete reports. And trichloral phosphate, which is available in the name of pedichlorin, 50 mg per kg body weight, single dose is enough to sedate these childs. Now, let's talk of individual lesions. Individual lesions, which are of your level, is we talk of ASD, we talk of VSD, we talk of PDA, we talk of coarctation, sorry, endocardial cushion defect and coarctation of aortas. Now, in ASD, we have a variety of ASD. At your level, what we talk of a primum ASD, secundum ASD, sinus venosus type of ASD. What is this primum, secundum ASD? This is normal, that's area of fossa virus. The hole at the level of secundum ASD at the level of fossa valis is known as secundum ASD. The hole closer to atioventricular valve is known as primum ASD. And the hole away from this is known as sinus venosus ASD. What happens if you develop an ASD? Lot of blood comes from LA because LA pressures are high, more than mean is 8. RA pressure is low, so blood comes from LA to LRA, RA to RV, then on this pulmonic artery back to L. So what will happen? RV, RA, they will be dilated. This is a volume overload conditions. Happen to see increased flow velocity across tricuspid valve, increased flow velocity across pulmonic artery, and on top of that, lot of blood which we will see coming from the pulmonic veins because the pulmonic veins will be getting a blood from the right ventricle from this particular vessels because of inherent what is draining from the body plus the ASD flow. And this is one picture, parasol short axis view at aorta. You can see this is LA, this is RA, this is inflow part of a RV, this is outflow part of the RV. And you see a defect over here. And look, RV and RA, they are dilated. And once you switch on the colors, in this subset of population, we categorically see that there is a lot of blood which is happening flowing from LA to RA. And in this kind of a condition, we go and see in four chamber view, here is a morphological LA, here is a morphological LV, here is a RA, here is a RA. Look, the first picture which I showed was a bullet-shaped LV and a triangular RV. Here RV, RA, they are almost two times size of an LV. That's the most important thing is, and this patient is obviously when switch on the colors, you'll find a lot of blood which is going from pulmonic veins through the intraatrial septum to RV, RA and RV. And that's what makes a diagnosis. If you happen to see a break in the septum in the middle, that is secundum, closer to atrioventricular valves is primum, and away from the atrioventricular valve is sinus venosus type of waste. And we can measure these. Uh, in uh, this uh, ASD over a period of time. But at your level, even if you identify this ASD, that's more than enough to refer this subset to a population of our doctors who are practicing pediatric cardiology. Now, another example of secundum ASD. Look, RVI is bigger than LVLA. And that's how it makes a lot of difference when we look at a secundum ASD. Now look at the effect of primum ASD. This is a primum ASD. There is no septum in between. Whole of the septum is gone. And this variety is sometimes known as common AV canal defect. So this is one leaflet. This is another leaflet, but there is no septum in between. And that's what we say common AV canal defect. This is three-dimensional picture.
This is what you need to remember in your clinical practice. What you need to remember in your clinical practice is we have three type of ASD. One ASD is the size of the ASD is less than four millimeters. And this size of ASD less than four millimeters, they are known as patent foramen ovary. If the ASD is more than 8 millimeters, invariably they require closers. And if they are between 4 to 8 millimeters in size, observation is the right answer for these subset of operations. Majority of ASD, they are secundum ASD at the reviews of fossa ovals. In those ASD, if they are less than 4 millimeters of a size, we call them as patent for a ovale. If they are 8 millimeters or more in size, we call them as true ASD, which almost always require a device closer and small ASD between 4 to 8 needs observations. From ASD to VSD and that's what is the most important thing is we look at various VSD in the form of locations and that location you have to understand these locations are we known them then as Inlet VSD or outlet VSD. So what kind of a variety of VSDs are? We call them as inlet VSD, outlet VSD, muscular VSD and perimembranous VSD. And for doing this, we need to have an evaluation in multiple windows. What are the windows where we need to do an evaluation? The windows are apical four chamber view. Apical five chamber view, then parasol long axis view, and the parasol short axis. If the ASD VSD is seen when the aorta is closed, this is known as inlet VSD. If in five chamber view ASD VSD is seen, we say outlet VSD. And if you go to parasol long axis view, if you happen to see a VSD close to aortic valve, which is known as perimembranous VSD. And another variety of VSD is, that's what we have drawn with a figure of by hand. Look at the personal short axis view at aorta. This is perimembranous VSD. This is doubly committed VSD associated with AR majority of time. And this is muscular VSD. So what do we do? We go to four chamber view to talk about inlet VSD. Then outlet VSD, parasol short axis view aorta to talk about perimembranous, doubly committed and muscular VSDs. In plaques window, if you happen to see, that is perimembranous outlet VSD. Why these VSDs are important? Nomenclature, because based on their location, we try to treat them accordingly. Suppose in 2024, I've got a mid-muscular VSD. VSD, something like this. If I've got a mid-muscular VSD, this is inlet mid-muscular VSD. If this kind of a VSD is present, if it requires closure, obviously we have to do, we can try a device closures. If the same VSD is present, I am going to show you one more picture. Look, this is mid muscular outlet VSD. And the, this is mid muscular inlet VSD. This is one plaques window we happen to see a personal long axis view of VSD. This is a parasonal long axis view giving rise to perimembranous VSD. And this kind of a perimembranous VSD, if it needs closure, we always do a surgical closure. Similarly, if we happen to see a VSD at the level of RVOT and this, there is doubly committed VSD, we always need a closure of by surgical. So location is very, very important in diagnosing VSD. Next important thing happens what? 
there are two variety of VSD. One variety is a restrictive VSD. Second is a non-restrictive VSD. Restrictive VSD means smaller hole, high gradients. So if somebody has got a small hole with a high gradient, they are not affecting a circulation of the pulmonary site. On the other hand, we have a non-restrictive VSD. If you happen to see a picture like over here, Look at this VSD. You see a bi-directional flow. The flow is towards a transducer and away from a transducer. This bi-directional flow, if it's present, we need, we call them as non-restrictive VSD. And if we try to close these non-restrictive VSDs, they should be done as early as possible before this reversal happens. So if you happen to see a non-restrictive VSD, where the gradient between two the gradient between two chambers of LV and RV is very small. It means the pulmonary artery pressures are very high. On the other hand, if the gradients are large, we understand that the VSD is a small VSD. So one thing is location of a VSD. Second thing is restrictive versus non-restrictive. Third comes patent ductus arteriosus. Now, ASD, we had a shunt between atrial symptom. VSD, we shunt with the ventricular level. And now we have a shunt between aorta and pulmonic artery. So what exactly happens? A lot of blood will go from aorta to pulmonic artery, then back to LA, back to LV, and you find dilated RV, LV and LV. Now, this is devised by, detected by parasolar short axis view at aorta. This is a parasolar short axis view at aorta. Here is a reversal of flow from descending aorta to pulmonic artery. Another view looking at this is same thing. Look how much the blood is flowing from descending artery to descending aorta to pulmonic artery. And if we happen to see this kind of flow and which is shows a diastolic spill means continuous flow is seen, then we try to talk this as patent ductus arteriosus, which obviously, if you happen to find a PD at any age, irrespective of size, it needs closer. And that's why you remember in pediatric population, if a child is born with a PDA, it lasts for a few days, they always try to close it by medically. So we saw ASD, we saw VSD, we saw PDA. And then the last important thing, what we see in this subset of population is, we look for coactation of aorta. So what we see in normal life is, asynotic is ASD, VSD, PDA, and then the coactation of aorta. And when we happen to see a coarctation of aorta, it presents a coarctation of aorta distal to the left subclavian artery. And how do we look for coarctation of aorta distal to left subclavian arteries? We have to go in the suprasonal window, switch on a colors as shown over here. And when we happen to see a colors in the descending aorta, look, there's a lot of turbulence at this point. Here is a left pulmonic artery. So this is known as distal to left pulmonic artery. This is turbulence. And if you put a continuous wave Doppler, you will see a gradient across this Doppler shell. This is a Doppler just before the quark. This is a continuous wave Doppler across the quark. So you can see a Doppler flow pattern just before the quark and after the quark by continuous wave Doppler. Any gradient more than 30 millimeters of mercury is considered to be a serious condition which requires immediate interventions. So that's how we look at a coactation of aorta. And take my word, this is a very common thing, unfortunately seen in adult population even today also. How do these people will present in a clinical practice? They present as hypertensive, not controlled by medicine. 
and the very classically says as sir if my blood pressure gets controlled i am not able to walk very true the history is telling you when the bp his her or his or her high blood pressure is the driving force of blood across this coagulation of aorta if you reduce this driving force from 200 to 120 there is not adequate blood which is flowing to the lower limbs and the patient has got a very common complaint my bp gets normal but i am not able to walk and that leads to number of time a diagnosis of coagulation of aorta in elderly populations i hope you understand what i mean to say these people will present with lvh uncontrolled blood pressure and one of the reasons for uncontrolled blood pressure is coagulation of aorta. Another example of coagulation of aorta. All I wanted to talk about the pediatric populations at your level. Look, it's a huge topic. First of all, you have to understand what exactly are you looking for. You have to identify the various chambers. Once you identify the chambers, then you talk of a shunt lesions. And finally, once you detect a lesion, obviously always look for referring to a person who's got pediatric cardiology practice. So I'll stop over here and take your questions one by one. And that's very interesting phenomenon. Can you raise your hands so that I'm able to answer your questions? I've tried to make it as simple as possible. I could make it as complicated as possible, but that's what I'm trying to make it as simple. Before I start taking up a question, remember, write on a piece of paper is, if you have an ASD, RVRA would be dilated. That significant ASD will always lead to a dilated RVRA. If you have a VSD or PDA, the LV side chambers will be significantly dilated. Left ventricle, left atrium. If you have a coagulation of aorta, you always think these people will present with left ventricle hypertrophy. So if patient is presenting with left ventricle hypertrophy, either he or she has got aortic stenosis or get a coagulation of aorta. So let's take first question from Dr. Sachi Surenta. <laughs> Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, uh, I, I, uh, I request you to uh, come again on uh, uh, the uh, PDA, sir. The short, ac short access view. Please, I just want short access view look? at Iota. Let me go back and show my, share my slides again. Normally, this is pulmonic artery, short axis via aorta. It bifurcates to right pulmonic artery and left pulmonic artery. This is a descending aorta. If you happen to see a blood which is happening from descending aorta to pulmonic artery, in person with short axis via aorta, always think of PD. Is it descending, descending aorta? Descending aorta, sir. Which one? This is a descending aorta. <laughs> Okay, sir. You are seeing a flow from descending aorta to pulmonary artery. Pulmonic artery. Because descending aorta blood pressure would be, in neonates would be 60, and pulmonic artery blood pressure systolic would be RV systolic pressure, which is 25. Okay. All right. Let's move on to next person. Dr. Avinash Balgir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, uh, inlet VSD and outlet VSD uh, uh, that I didn't get. Inlet means when we see a four chamber view. Very simple. I'll just come down to that slide.
This is four chamber view. Is that correct, Avinash? Yes, sir. This is five chamber view. Yes. Sir. If you happen to see a VSD in this intertil septum, this will be septum. This is known as inlet VSD, inlet muscular VSD. If you happen to see a VSD in this anterior septum, this is known as outlet VSD. Clear? Okay, Four sir. chamber versus five chamber. Five so chamber. If VSD is visible in uh, just four chamber, it is always in inlet. And if it is in uh, five chamber, it is outlet. Outlet VSD. Right. Okay. Ravi Bala Mahajan. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, please explain coarctation of aorta. Where the coact of aorta is present? Coactation of aorta is present in aorta and is present yes, in descending aorta. Correct? Yes, sir. to left subclavian vein. Oh, sorry, artery. Yes, sir. So when it is present distal to subclavian artery, then what exactly happens? You happen to see a flow of blood in descent. Look, this is arch of aorta. This is suprasun window. Yes, sir. So this is arch of ascending uh, aorta, arch of aorta. And this is descending aorta. Here is a left subclavian artery. In normal circumstances, if you switch on the colors, they'll be seen as uniform colors of blue color. Yes. If you happen to see a turbulence, that suggests that possibly we are dealing with coactation of aorta. Then how do you assess it? Yes. Two things we do, like we do in the aortic stenosis. Once we keep a sample volume by pulse, this before the aortic before the quacks. So what we get? We get a yes, green sir. for the quack. Then we switch over to continuous wave Doppler. We'll be getting a gradient across the Dopplers. So that's what exactly happened. This is a gradient before the quack and this is graded across the quack. This is 36. Yes, sir. Four was the gradient before the quack. The effective gradient is 36 minus 4, 32. Any gradient which is more than 20 is considered to be a significant gradient as far as the quark is concerned. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Arif. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, kindly, sir, kindly explain about sir, uh, foramen oval versus ASD, sir. Foramen oval versus ASD is very simple. You look at the size of ASD. If it's less than 4 millimeter in size, we call them as foramen oval, patent foramen oval, PFO. If they are more than 8 millimeter in size, that's a true ASD, which needs a closer definitely. And in between 4 to 8, we call them as observation ASDs. <laughs> This is my pediatric. Say that again, Varif. Uh, you told that in between four and eight, we call we call it small ASD. Small. We yes, need yes, observation yes. whether they are growing or becoming smaller. Look what exactly happens in this four or up to eight millimeters. The RVR they are not dilated. Pulmonic pressures have not gone up. If RV are they are not dilated, it means insignificant. Yes. If you remember what we read during medical college, if there is some shunt which is significant, it will have a QPQS ratio of more than 2 is to 1. Correct? What is that QPQS ratio? The amount of stroke volume at LRVOT will be 2 times of the stroke volume at LVOT. Yes, Clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Let's move on to Dr. Somnath. Dr. Somnath, go ahead. In, in coarctation of aorta, where do we have to put the sample volume? But in coarctation of aorta, we have to put sample volume just before the quart. That's what we get a gradient before the quarts. Because the aorta has its own gradients. So we'll keep a one pulse wave sample volume before the quart to get a pre quart gradients and this is what we have done look just a second i'll go back to the presentation again the pulse uh, this, wave and uh, continuous wave has to be kept at the same place 
Correct, correct, correct. Now, what you do in LV, uh, when you do aortic stenosis, you do the same thing virtually in coactation of aorta. Clear? So this is where I'm going to keep is, I'll keep a pulse wave at this point and then I switch over to continuous wave Doppler. Once I'll keep a pulse wave just before the quag, I'll be getting this Doppler flow pattern which has got a gradient of only 1 meter per second velocity, 4 meter for gradients. Then I switch over to continuous wave Doppler. Look at the two patterns which you see over here. One is just before the quag and this is the gradient across the quag. So this gradient is almost 3 meters per second, 3 into 3 into 4, 36. Minus 4 of the pre-quad, that is 32 millimeter of a gradient across the quad. All right. Let's move to Dr. Ripon. Dr. Ripon, can we go ahead? Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. So, you know, explain uh, EHD in Plex view. What is the direction of flow of blood towards the transducer or away from the transducer? This is Plex view. This is aorta, LA, LV, aorta. Just before the aorta, you see a defense, uh, defect in the interventricular septum. Correct? If I go by the nomenclature, this is will be known as outlet yes. perimembranous VSD. Perimembranous is close to LVOT, in the LVOT. So this is known as perimembranous outlet VSD. Now I switch on the colors. If you happen to see switch on the colors is, let me try to stop the colors will flow from LV to RV, correct? And they'll be red in color. But the same colors are seen between LV and RV which are blue in color. Look, it's blue in color. It means the blood is coming from RV to LV. Right? So, when this kind of a bidirectional flow happens, it means RV and LV pressure, they have become equal. Normal LV pressure would be 55 in newborn. RV pressure would be 25. So, there is a gradient of 30 millimeters of mercury effectively transformed into more than 2.7 meters per second of velocity. Here the velocity is almost negligible. So it means LV RV pressure they have equalized to a large extent. Correct? Yes, sir. Anybody else? You. It's a difficult topic. But I am trying to make it as simple as possible. Dr. Ravi Bala, you want to ask something more? Sir, how can we measure ASD size? How can you measure ASD size? It's very simple. Go to subcostal window and measure the LV uh, ASD size. So here is the subcostal window, here is the RV, the RA, the LV and LA. You measure the size of the ASD in the subcostal window. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Avinash Balgir, Dr. Ripon or Sachi Surendran? Yes, sir. Any questions? Sir, Some... uh, just uh, part of this. Pardon? May I, sir? Say it again, I couldn't. May, ah, yes, sir. Uh, cord versus, ah, yes, sir. This is Avinash Balgir, sir. Uh, cord versus dissection, sir, means uh, sometimes uh, you uh, in the view that you've shown, uh, looks like two uh, flows, but uh, adding it. Um, sometimes you may have that uh, dissection. Dissection where, dear? So now, so Avinash, I'm not able to understand your question, man. Sir, uh, in aortic dissection versus uh, protection of aorta, sir. 
Aortic dissection versus coarctation of aorta. Okay. Aortic dissection versus dissection of aorta would be the basic difference is large. In dissection of aorta, we have got another compartment which is lying over there. In coarctation of aorta, there is nothing like another compartment. Uh, yes, this is mirror mirror also it looks like a two flows. No, sir. Yeah, this is mirror image. This is artifact. The true flow oh. is over here. Okay. And if it's dissection of aorta, so blood will only flow in the true lumen, not in a quiet, uh, dissected lumen. Blood is accumulating in the dissected lumen. The true lumen will always show a blood flow. That's a different entity altogether. In quiet, and in the section of aorta, BP will be low, not high. Right? Yes, sir. Dr. Sachi, go sir, ahead. Sir, Surendran here, sir. What is the yeah. clinical significance of, sir, uh, what is the clinical significance of PFOs? We tend to often come across PFOs in uh, asymptomatic adult patients also. Only problem with PFOs is they are the site for uh, cryptogenic strokes. Okay, sir. Because small emboli which are formed in right side of a legs or somewhere else, if they come to RA, they can switch over to left hand side through these PFOs and may produce stroke. Otherwise, they have no relationship. Oh. Patient presenting with giddiness, syncope, if they have a PFO, you must always look at this PFO more carefully. Oh, okay, sir. Right? But this PFO should be closed, sir, for that sake. If it's symptomatic, yes. If it's symptomatic, yes. Sir, symptomatic means some, symptomatic. somebody getting a giddiness the or... Is symptomatic. So, in those cases, we always try to close these PFOs. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Sir, is it important to measure the VSD? I am sure. Uh, we used to measure VSD long back. But problem with VSD is, if you are happen to measure a VSD, VSD are very small sizes, like 3 millimeter, 5 millimeter, 4 millimeters, right? So if you happen to measure a VSD of 5 millimeter, somebody else measure a VSD of 3 millimeter, that will be a really problematic. If you measure three, somebody else measured at five, there'll be a really problematic. So what we look always is to look at a gradient across these VSTs. I said okay. restrictive versus non-restrictive VSTs. <laughs> if you want to go still detail of that, another answer would be to look at a stroke volume at LVOT versus RVOT. If the VSD is significant, that is non-restrictive VSD, the stroke volume of RVOT would be two times of LVOT. Okay. So we try to avoid measuring VSD and because it causes a lot of problem for the subsequent guy and person who has done an echo before us. Okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nitin Pare. In uh, coarctation of aorta, you said there will be hypertension, but actually due to should be uh, decreased blood supply to the body. So, like I'm not getting it because in coarctation of aorta, look, this is the picture of coarctation. Here is the aortic valve. Yes, sir. This is ascending aorta, arch of aorta. This is descending aorta. So, if there is no aortic stenosis, this aorta, this coarctation of aorta is putting a load on your LV. Yes, sir. So your lower limbs may have a low blood pressure, but upper limbs in left subclavian artery and right subclavian artery will show a high blood pressure. Okay, okay, sir. What you mean to say is, because of a decreased blood supply, patient will have intermittent claudications. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. So one more question is there. Go ahead. Uh, if like we find the VSD during this uh, myocardial infarction, can it be treated? VSD, VSD produced by myocardial infarction should be treated immediately. 
is a very dangerous condition. Yes. Uh, majority of time, yes, surgery sir. is being done. Otherwise, they need a device closure. Some people, they device, try device closure, but surgery is the most important. Okay, sir. Dr. Shekhar Chakravarti. No, sir, I, I have already asked question. Thank okay, you. right. Thank you. I have not made this topic very complicated today. I have tried to make it as simple as possible because majority of slides which I had in my computers, they are of level 2, level 3. So anybody else? Before we stop it over here. Remember one important thing. If you get a child to do an echo examination, all three of you should be comfortable. Yourself, patient, mean neonate or child, and a patient's mom. So is being done over a period of maybe one to two hours time. Initially scan a child while he's weeping. If there's no complication, nothing of significant. Like suppose small ASD is present, we are not really bothered, we sedate these childs and then we do an echo again because we need all measurements according to G score and a Z score. And when we do an echo, we try to record all findings and then we comprehend later on looking at these findings. Sir, my question is that uh, Go ahead, Alex. Think that sequentially, how we can approach? Very simple. I said the first thing is put your transducer in the abdomen, index marker at three o'clock. So once you put a transducer in the abdomen, so first picture you will see is normal picture. What you will see in abdomen is. Look, this is the normal picture. This is a spine. Here is a descending aorta and here is IVC. This is 90 degree in the abdomen. Now you move from a 90 degree to sub same as you do in subcostal window. So what you'll do? You will see the footprint looking at the right shoulder. Now this is 90 degree going to almost parallel. Once you start going parallel, this image will open up. And if this is the image with the index marker on right, left, this on left hand side. So this is anterior, this is posterior, this is left, this is right. So you can say very safely, look, patient has got a cyta solitus with D loop. So here RV and RA, they are anterior and left to LV and L. Don't get into too much of a complication. First, do this picture. So this is one aorta, this is IVC. This IVC should open into this morphological array. Till date, it has never happened. The IVC is open to LA. So it's a fixed. Whenever it's open to the structure, this is one RA. Other chamber is LV, LA. And to identify this chamber being LA, you move this subcostal window to slide from subcostal window to apical. <laughs> Is that correct? Yes. So always we should start with the subcostal view. Always, always, 110%. We are always upside down. We go to the last, we start from subcostal, go to apical, go to parasol long axis view, then go to suprasal. And we always do a last suprasal because we have to extend the neck of a child. And whenever you extend the neck of a child, child will start crying. Okay. When she will come for hands-on, we'll demonstrate you these things. All right, Arif, Ripon, anybody else? Uh, yes, sir. Agreed, Go ahead. Sir. Any question, uh, Arif? Uh, <laughs> regarding the same question, sir. Regarding the PFO, uh, sir, you said uh, we differentiate the SD and by PFO depending upon the size. Whether right. uh, um, it is located at the side of primum or secundum, still we will label it as PFO, depending upon that uh, less than 4 mm size, no. sir. 
if it's if it's at the level of second name ASD, we label them as PFOs. This is patent patent foramen ovary. The PFO is not at the level of atrioventricular junction, not at the level of sinus venosal junction. PFO means foramen ovale. That is second arm ASD kind of thing. Correct? Yes, sir. 90% of the lesions are in the level of second arm ASD. Primum is only 5%. SVC defects are still less 2%. So we label PFO in the secundum level or at the level where secundum ASD happens. The word itself tells you patent foramen ovale. Patent foramen ovale means the foramen ovale which is present in the fetus time remains patent during neonatal or adulthood is known as patent foramen ovale. Most of the time it will be at the level of secundum. Well, it, be the, itself, it should be only at the level of secundum. Then we talk of PFOs. Thank you, sir. All right. So I'll stop it over here and I'll send you the recording of all this to all of you. Take care, stay safe, and we meet on Friday at about 7.30 or so. Dr. Parashar would be taking a class. Some, some of the people had a concern that we are doing a little faster. Take my words, I can still take up multiple classes despite finishing this lecture. You have to just put on a WhatsApp. Whatever the topic we have covered, if you want to take a fresh classes, because a couple of things I'll be doing even after after the finish of the classes is I'll have to take your exams. I have to take your classes, question answer sessions, and then discuss those papers which you have gone through. And they'll be all done on Friday. That will be my would be suggestion would be Friday. I'll be doing all those kind of a thing based on your availability as well as your convenience. With this word, let me pay thanks to each, of, each and every one of you. And my humble request, please join with your name because it makes very difficult for us to take your attendance. Good night. Shabbat stay safe. We'll meet on Friday. We'll let you know the time exact when we'll be doing it.